the title in 45 minutes is what will life be like when we can fully modulate the nervous system the impact on disease drugs the healthcare industry personal freedom and privacy i say that's a well focused 45 minutes when you say <laughs> this reminds me of my days at cnn you know can you can you cover science in 2 minutes no the short answer is no um, so let's, let's just bring the panelists up and we'll just figure out you know, how much of this we can tackle in 45 minutes. Uh, in, in the order they're published, I'll just go with that. How's that? Kevin Tracy is with uh, the Feinstein Institute. You're there. Are you, on, are you on the panel? You're on the panel? Oh, you're not. <laughs> you can join in anytime you like, though. Yeah. All right, I know me. Polina Hanekeva is with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Chad Boughton is with um, the Feinstein Institute. And Peter Olofsson is with the Karolinska Institute. Did I pronounce that correctly? More or less. And Doug Weber, who was just up here a moment ago with DARPA. Uh, good to have you all this. Give him a round of applause for hanging in. I didn't know no was an option. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to title this, I, it would be, When Do I Get My Arm? And um, <laughs> Doug, <laughs> where's do my arm? <laughs> So uh, recruiting volunteers, right? I, I, you know, I'm I'm probably demographic of one. I'm a science and technology correspondent on television with one arm, and so everybody, I, I have a certain amount of visibility, and everybody asks me, well, why don't you have a Luke arm? You, you of all people, as kind of the uber geek on television, should have it. And <laughs> and uh, what what was most interesting to me uh, going through this experience now, approaching three years ago when I lost my arm, um, was uh, I thought. I knew a lot about this. I had actually done some stories on this before I was a customer, as they say. And uh, I, I got to say that uh, the, the bi-manual media doesn't get it at all. Uh, we get, we're kind of fascinated by the, the gee whiz, the, the Luke aspects. Uh, they look cool, right? You know? and, um, and more recently, we've seen a lot of these uh, 3D uh, printed sure. arms, which have caught a lot of attention. But no one really asks the important question, like, how do you really drive this thing? You know, I'm about to go on a trip to Europe, and I, I'm, you know, making sure I have all all the right you know, voltage adapters. What's the where's the adapter for my residual arm that you can just kind of plug in? And that seems to be the bottleneck uh, that that continues. I mean, when you look at uh, the wonderful work that Dean Kamen is doing, and you really get down in the weeds as somebody like me who's really now looking at how this thing works or doesn't, and you got to run it with a foot pedal, uh, you have to ask yourself. Uh, can't we do better than that? So I'm putting you a little bit on the spot on that. I know DARPA has, has invested a lot of money in this, but I will tell you this, uh, it's been slow in coming. And I, I went to uh, Maryland to APL and uh, I tried out the, uh, I drove that arm, that wonderful, beautiful arm, but it's, uh, it's stuck to a bench pretty sure. much for the likes of me. 21 degrees of freedom is great. Uh, curling 50 pounds, wonderful. I can't do that with this arm. I don't know why we need that. Um, I, I, I just, I, some, some of it, kind of, I, I get the idea. Where there are many of us, it's, it's not a great business model, but what I see is very exciting here because I see robotics technology, bioelectronics, all kind of merging together, creating um, enough critical mass that somebody like me can benefit from all of this. But I do want to ask you, <laughs> that's a long way of saying, you know, the, the, uh, the enemy of the good is perfection here. It, uh, it has DARPA, with all good intentions, set the bar so high that um, people like us are, are waiting a little too long. Well, I don't want to say that the bar has been set too high, but, but certainly we have created a range of capabilities. The Luke Arm has 10 degrees of freedom, and it's FDA approved, and is going to be commercialized this fall. So. It's available or it will be available very soon, but you're right that there's a, um, a limitation in how it's controlled. The foot-mounted controls are clearly not ideal. The haptics program uh, fills that gap though, right? We are creating fully implantable systems, so it'll be you know, plug and play basically. You won't have to worry about uh, putting something on every day. You won't have to worry about calibrating it um, to your new position or the size of your, uh, of your limb that day. It will just work. What's your? I mean, I, I went to Dustin Tyler's lab uh, mm -hmm. in Cleveland, and uh, that, that was that was very interesting seeing that uh, in action. Uh, what's your sense about how soon that might become a reality outside of the lab? Because I, the, the gentleman who I met there, I think his name is Igor, I believe, mm -hmm. very nice guy, Igor Spedek, and right. he's, he's got wires hanging out of his arm, and it kind of you know that's. Uh, Right. God bless him for doing it. He's, doing, he's really doing a great thing for maybe somebody like me later. 
So, so, so that's the current limitation, right, is that we don't yet have the implantable electronics that allow us to communicate with those implanted electrodes. So the electrodes, the, the, the hardware to nerve interface, I think is workable. Like we have demonstrated capability there. What we need is that next link, the electronics that couple the nerve to the uh, prosthesis. And that's what we're working on in haptics. All right, and so Dustin is part of the program. So Polina, I saw a talk you gave about how it might be possible one day to, to kind of wirelessly capture what our brain is thinking. Is that, is that a realistic notion? Well, uh, we just had this uh, conversation a few minutes ago with Peter, and uh, the work that our lab has been doing actually has been in wirelessly imprinting information rather than capturing, and which turns out to be an easier problem. And mm -hmm. we can do that right now with uh, the help of magnetic fields and uh, a few nanoparticles that are essentially dissolved in a liquid like an espresso. But uh, in terms of capturing information, this is, a, uh, I would say, a sea of information that is not so different from um, what we have recently seen in the gravitational wave detector. So what seemed impossible two decades ago because of huge noise might become possible as our detectors get better. The problem is that to source through that sea of noise in the body, we have to scale to the same level of effort as we did to detect gravitational waves. Oh, wow. So signal-to-noise ratio a little bit. Our signal-to-noise ratio is now quite low. Yeah. And in fact, we are currently limited by the fact that uh, unlike gravitational waves that are in vacuum, humans are warm and we cannot cool the detector down to uh, liquid helium uh, temperature. So, so we, have, uh, we have to come up with better ways to go about it. So that's why we do foot pedals. <laughs> it's basically, yeah, so, um, they can be room temp. It's really nice, you know? That's, that's right. But that's the matter of uh, uh, invasive versus non-invasive. So yeah. right now we have hardware to do uh, non-invasive input informa of information, but in order to extract information at the source, we still have to be invasive. Well, so let's talk about this invasive thing for a moment. Uh, I've been thinking about that a little bit because I'm actually scheduled to have surgery in January, and, and I'm not even sure, you know, if technology will pass that by, but, you know, couldn't you put something in my brain to, to have it, uh, you know, drive an arm effectively? You Where's willing to do that? I am willing to do yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, Just a few releases <laughs> to sign, and right. So a, a few releases that probably <laughs> will go from uh, from uh, down from the floor to the ceiling, and with the help of Chad, yeah. I think we should be able to to do that. So, but let's talk about what uh, Gene has talked in the Spark program. Let's talk about your nerves. So we have thousands and thousands of axons, so which means we need thousands and thousands of sensors to be able to interact with every individual axon or at least small groups of axon, because when we interact with the entire nerve, our readout is the voice has changed, or in your case, right. it'll be like, the arm is kind of stiff. Right, um, right. So kind of kind of like uh, AM radio versus high def or 4K, yeah. right? We're, but not, now, we're not quite there, are we? But now we do have a capability to produce essentially infinity of electrodes, and we're working on matching the material science of those electrodes to the material science of your nerves, because you don't want your interface to look like an iPhone, you want your interface to feel like a nerve. And this is what we are doing. So um, Chad, tell me uh, the, the work you've done primarily um, with uh, people with paralysis. Yes. Does, does that apply to, to amputees or is that a little different, you think? Well, no, absolutely. The part of where we tap into the brain and how we decipher those signals is directly applicable. Absolutely. Yeah. And we spent the last 10 years trying to figure out how to understand the language of the neurons. And the good news is the neurons in your brain uh, tend to kind of encode information by how fast they, they fire. Same thing happens in the nerves. I mean, nerves are an extension of the brain, really. So we are actually taking those methods, and we're now translating those over. How much better are, and I, I apologize, you guys are all experts on this. I'm just being the dumb guy. But how much better are the signals in the brain versus, you know, the nerves. it, it, it nerves at the end if I did this PMR surgery, for example. This is basically my private consultation. I hope you don't mind yeah. asking <laughs> All this stuff in the program, forget it. We're just talking about me, all right? So that's, I, that's, a, tough, that's a tough question. But in that procedure, uh, you're, mm -hmm. now, right, you're now going to have electrodes on the skin, right? Right. And so now it's a question of, well, how close can you pack those electrodes together on the skin? 
and there's some limitations. Whereas in these brain implants, which I'm a little biased towards those, and yeah. we only need 90 billion, by the way, or 100 billion electrodes. <laughs> <not really. laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's all we need. Uh, but well, we, we are really are complicated, aren't we? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, but that's, you know, in the brain, uh, there's an incredible amount of information. And we're finding with these, these tiny implants, uh, we tend to be able to pick that out. And in the motor cortex, uh, we can actually not only tell when someone intends to make a movement, uh, in certain parts of the, like the premotor and so on, we can actually even uh, estimate what they might want to do in the next second. Because we mm -hmm. plan every movement before we do it. So if somebody's, you know, a quadriplegic, you know, the decision to have a, um, something implanted in the brain, that's the only option, right? In my case, you can go a little further downstream. But right. is it, should amputees be thinking about this? It's funny. I was thinking about that earlier. It's, uh, and I've been asked that uh, before. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, you know, I think it's a personal, obviously, decision. It's uh, uh, I think that the technology continues to advance the way it is. I think in the next 10 years that, that could be a really viable option. So uh, we should talk a little bit about disease, Peter. And uh, it, the idea that we can, you know, uh, attack disease with um, electricity as opposed to drugs is really a fascinating idea uh, to those of us who are not as dialed into it. Are, are, we, are we moving to an era where we, we could start thinking about eliminating some, you know, classes of pharmacology in lieu of just applying, a, you know, the, the right jolts of electricity or jump circuiting things. Is that possible? It's certainly possible. And, and I think we are, we are closing in on that target, although we're not really there yet. Um, and I think um, what, what we have been hearing for the last couple of days here and people coming together, uh, understanding the mechanisms that underlie what happens in disease and how, how these um, processes are regulated. When we understand that, and if we can interact electrically with these processes, we can definitely maybe uh, get rid of some, some medicines. So let me ask you this, as somebody's, uh, and this is to anybody here, when you're, when you're going through the regulatory process for something that, an implantable device like this, something you drill into the brain versus a drug, is it, is it easier, harder? Uh, is, it, uh, does, is, there, uh, is everybody just kind of learning as they go? I think, I can't speak for the American situations, uh, but, uh, but I do know in, in, in Sweden at least that the regulatory process currently is much more simplified for, for devices than it is uh, for, for uh, pharmacological, pharmacological it compounds. It is. Yeah, and is, that, is the FDA that way or is it n not so? The FDA is definitely making uh, in, uh, advancements in trying to, to accelerate things through the process, mm -hmm. and, but there's still some work to be done. Is, it, is, is the process more streamlined in Europe? Well, it, it may be, but I think people are actually honestly in, in Europe discovering that the, the potency of these devices, and, and they may be, may be tightening this up actually uh, as we are moving forward in the field. Because the medical devices have been considered as a completely different entity than, than the pharmacological compounds in the past, but it may not continue that way. So it'd be put in the same category in theory. There is, there is a risk or, or a possibility, yes. Yeah. Risk or possibility, which do you like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> risk and possibility. Risk and possibility, what a great High risk, high gain, I guess. So, yeah, so. I suppose so, <laughs> yeah. I suppose so. The, uh, it, it, the, the fact that uh, all these potential applications that you've been talking about here today, how much do, do each of these applications inform the others? Or are they kind of their own little stovepipes? Who wants to take any of that? Anybody can go with that one. You want to do that, Chad? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think they do inform each other, yeah. absolutely. And really what we're trying to do is develop technology. One of the steps is develop technology that taps into the nervous system, right? To listen in, uh, to get these messages that are passing uh, from our organs and our entire body to our brain and back and forth. And uh, we're also trying to figure out how to decipher those signals, right, and learn that language. Uh, I, I mentioned yesterday, we, if we could you know, not only understand the maps, but understand the traffic patterns, I think it'll open up a whole uh, entire uh, new field. So what's, uh, where, where is it headed next? What's the, what's the next thing that, what's the next big question that needs to be answered before we have significant breakthroughs here? There's, there's many, well, there's many. So you yeah. want me to pick one? Yeah, pick one, <laughs> pick one. Um, I think, you know, right now we have trouble uh, kind of getting access to the information, right? And, and uh, Paulina mentioned that. And so we definitely need better technology. Um, it's, and I come from that side, but I think we still don't understand the mechanisms of uh, many of the diseases um, uh, that we're trying to treat. 
And so I think it's really how do, you, how do you bring those two together? It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg because you need the tools to be able to do the maps and understand the physiology better, right? And once you do that, you have to somehow adapt those tools into a final device, mm -hmm. uh, which is not necessarily the same form of those tools. So it, it, the, it, it's an interesting melding of, of disciplines, though, when you, when you start putting engineers in, and people who do this in, in one room. How does that work out? Do you guys get along or not? You know, it's a, a dog, <laughs> it's dogs and cats, right? I mean, yeah, right? <laughs> I, I disagree. I, I, <laughs> the, I, I, Bring us together, Paulina, please, really. So, the, um, from my personal experience, so my PhD was in optoelectronics, and then I spent two years in a basic neuroscience lab. And uh, that was a learning experience to understand. Did they talk to you? They did, yeah, uh, they good, did talk good, to yeah. me. Uh, yeah. They actually made me do all my own surgeries. And that was an eye-opening experience. And I, I think suspect. if every engineer had a chance to be able to step into essentially physicians and neuroscientists' shoes for at least some time for you know one week or one year or however long is needed, then that dialogue becomes a lot more streamlined. And in my own lab, all my students who are engineers do their own implantations in this way they know what they're designing for so it's easier for them to have a conversation with Chad or have a conversation with Peter about what are the requirements of the system what should we be designing for so it's absolutely uh, mandatory that uh, the, the, the disciplines work together in order for this to work right I mean yes, yes. yes. Yeah. and this may actually be one of the major hurdles that needs to be overcome because I think there is so much promise in, in engineers and, and medical doctors and molecular biologists starting to understand each other. And currently I think that's actually a challenge on, on the detail level that, that we really understand what to design for and what problems are possible to address. You got something to add to that? W one of the biggest challenges is the language barrier, right? Neuroscientists and biologists speak a very different language than engineers and computer scientists. And so finding common ground to share ideas and act on them is something we struggle with all the time, especially with our interdisciplinary programs. So what, let's, we, we probably should do something that's related to the, the, the actual published uh, talk here for a moment. Uh, so um, it, if, if, we're all, if we're all kind of these, uh, you know, hackable neural networks, you know, uh, I mean, how, how many, um, I think, how many people were affected by the Yahoo hack? How many millions of people? So if you could hack into people's, you know, brains, arms, devices, uh, first, I, I'm thinking of that Homeland episode, you know, where he hacked into the, the vice president's heart. I mean, is, is, that, is that just pure Hollywood, or should we, is this a, a concern you guys are thinking about? Who wants yeah, it? We have to make it work before we can hack into it. <laughs> <laughs> These are the problems you want, right? <laughs> Okay, I'll take that, yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, we can hack into it. That means it works. That's awesome. <laughs> so, all right, well, that's, that's down the road. But, I mean, you know, go ahead. No, I, I think I, I agree it needs to work. Before we get, but at the same time, when we make it work, we can actually think about these, uh, these design issues from the outset, which can make it much easier to deal with this down the road. And I mean, I learned from people at this conference, Patrick Lincoln, for example, that, that there is technology now where you can, you can build in, in hardware security in a completely different way and design systems that are different than what we're doing today. And, and that, I think, would be a great thing for this field going forward, to, to design it with that in mind. Yes. So we become, um, we, we kind of march down the road to becoming augmented humans. Does this change humanity in some profound way? Yes. Yeah, no question. Eventually. Question. Eventually. <laughs> Again, we, these we, are the problems you want, right? We, we are a long yeah. way from, from changing humans. Um, you know, we are working hard to help humans recover function. We're starting to think about how we might use the same technology and approach to enhance human capabilities. But again, that's a dream at this point. Well, you mentioned that enhancement. One of the stories I did before I became a customer, as it were, and it was all around Oscar Pistorius and mm -hmm. whether he should compete in the sure. Olympics and, and that he had an unfair advantage. Here was a man without, you know, the two, two lower limbs, and he has an unfair advantage, which is an extraordinary thing when you think about it. So are, do, is there uh, this, you know, a brave new world waiting for us where, um, you know, people who can afford it make themselves superhumans? 
That's but, a yes. We're, yeah. heading, we're heading in that direction. We are. Yes, so, so do, sh how worried should we be about that? But you, on the other hand, I can't say that we haven't been doing it for the entire human evolution. So take a modern human from, let's say, New York and compare them to an ancient human from 9,000 years ago, and we are superhumans. We are enhanced in every way. And better dressed and, too. And for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, for, for both uh, educationally and we are fitter. Well, I mean, we have eyeglasses, we have hearing aids, we have all kinds yeah. of gadgets, yeah. so, right? Yes. I mean, we are enhanced. So now the trick is that we are just doing it sufficiently fast that one generation remembers the difference, the difference with the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that somehow we are all scared of that pace, but we feel completely comfortable with that change for the past uh, millennia. Right. So are you scared at all? Why? I don't know. <laughs> you mentioned it. I just <laughs> do you see some scariness in all of this? Do you, do you, I mean, do you guys, or is this not a, a problem you worry about? Um, uh, I'll wait to get scared when we get it to work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. I, was just a, yeah. I agree with Doug, though. We're working on restoration now. Uh, but if we, as we continue to refine those technologies, uh, it, it's not too difficult to imagine that the restoration can turn into augmentation or extra power. I mean, even you mentioned the, the ability of some of these arms to lift uh, pretty heavy loads. Yeah, curling that 50 pounds would be all right. Yes. Yeah. Be, yeah. So, so sort of the, the key for me is really autonomy. If So long as the individual is given the right to choose whether they want to enhance their brain or their vision or whatever else, mm -hmm. then, I, then it doesn't scare me at all. You know, but if it's something that becomes forced upon an individual or a group of people, um, then I think it's more problematic. And, and there's no simple answer to this, you know, questions like this. And this, you know, as, as the technology evolves, our, our culture is going to have to adapt um, if we're to embrace it. And it adds another dimension to the, the haves and have-nots uh, argument, you know, right? Potentially, Potentially yes. right? Those who can afford to augment will, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, when am I getting my arm? That's uh, we, we, you know, I didn't get an answer. <laughs> uh, the DECA arm is available, <laughs> available for sale uh, this fall. Uh, well, there Friday. is this little <laughs> detail. Black Friday sale uh, <laughs> right after Thanksgiving. Uh, you will have to um, put a down payment on your haptic system because that will take a couple more years. But I'm, I'm dead, dead serious. That so there'll be there'll gonna be a long line of arm amputees outside of <laughs> Dean Kamen's office in Manchester at three in the morning, you know, with the, the local news crews there. <laughs> Doug is taking deposits though. No, in all seriousness though. The, it does raise the question. I mean, sure. uh, obviously, insurance is, is a bit of a problem in, in this realm. I mean, um, it, it, prosthetics is always a challenge uh, right. when you get into the insurance realm. And when right. you're talking about 150,000 plus article, uh, that's, that's a big number. And as I said to my insurance company, if you're going to pay for the $150,000 arm, can I have a Tesla instead? Because that, <laughs> that'll actually help me just as much, if not more so, than the arm, you know? But anyway. And did you get a Tesla? No, no they said no. Oh. They said no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is a, certainly uh, is a concern of ours, and we've, we've engaged CMS and other payers to, to try to get a handle on you know, what influences their decision? You know, is it the price tag? Is $150,000 too much? You know, you know, should we be trying to work towards a lower price point? They said, no. All we care about is does it deliver value to the user? And are they going to continue using it? Because that is the problem with pr most of the prosthetics available today, is that people, you know, get the latest and greatest because their prosthetist promises them some, you know, increase in function and they find that it's too hard to use, too uncomfortable to wear, doesn't sort of meet their expectations, and it, they end up discarding it. And so these are the problems we need to solve, like make it useful to the individual. And I think we're, we're trying to do that. Um, and the take-home trial that we're going to do at the end of the haptics program will tell us you know, how well we've done at sort of uh, achieving those goals. Yeah, that'll be very exciting. Well, you, you can see the, the prosthetic I wear. It's a, sort of the similar situation, right, exactly. you know, the trade-off is. It's, I think it's very different when you're unilateral amputee, obviously. If you're bilateral, it's a whole different, uh, the bar is in a different place, put Absolutely. it that way. We yeah. understand that. I mean, this is an amazing thing, you know. It really is. And it's hard to compete. It's, it's hard to compete, but it's also, it's so amazing that it really takes up the slack for 
what's missing as well. So it's really, you, you have to, it ra kind of raises the bar for yeah, unilateral uh, sure. uses, I think. But if you had two of those, do you think you might use? Like if you had two if, I, if you could give me one, another one of these like I had, I'd be all, absolutely, I'd be all in for that. But it's a long way off, it seems to me. Or maybe not. Uh, I think it's closer than you think. Excellent, excellent. So. And can I have my Tesla too? Is that <laughs> So um, I, as far as things that are a little less uh, exotic than the, uh, the $150,000 arm, when you start talking about, you know, getting into getting insurance to pay for these things, are, is this is this something that's going to be hard to plow through the the whole process so that it becomes uh, readily available to you know a, a large audience? I think time will tell. Time will tell. And right now, there's not very many units obviously being made, sure. and that number will start out very small. And we all know obviously the number has to go up for price to come down. So it really depends, I guess, on each application. Yeah. If you're talking about some of the neuromodulation, yeah, uh, yeah, the exactly. broader field of right. neuromodulation mm -hmm. technologies, we're seeing a growing number of, of wearable neuromodulation devices, or devices that stimulate nerves uh, through the skin, um, transcranial devices, peripheral nerve devices. I'm not endorsing any of them. I'm just you know making the point that if we if technology like that really works and offers value to um, patients, or you know maybe uh, maybe they're not treating a medical condition, maybe they're just trying to improve mood or something else. Um, if, if the technology is available, it won't be very expensive because it's, uh, it's fairly simple. There's always a compliance issue too. Uh, in certain cases, uh, it's, it may be better to have an implantable where you just kind of forget about it mm -hmm. and it, it automatically does what it needs to do every day. Uh, compliance is a major issue, you know, especially with pharmaceuticals right now. But even on the implantable side, we're seeing a, a, a growing number of injectable devices, right? So, you know, so now, you know, now you have a stimulator that you can inject through a needle to target a deep nerve. Um, so it's on all the time, um, mm -hmm. or on hopefully whenever you want it. Uh, so you, you can deliver the implantable deliver by the injection, implant. and it goes to where it's supposed to go and stays. Hopefully, in. yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that, right. How far along are we on that? So um, it's coming. Close. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, so there are injectable um, pacing devices already. So um, I shouldn't speak for Medtronic, but I believe Medtronic has a, a leadless pacemaker. So it's a um, it's a large device. I don't know how injectable it is, but it's certainly delivered, um, you know, through a um, through a lead or through a, um, a catheter. Um, there are devices like the Bion, which have uh, were first used in humans in 1999. They've sort of didn't quite. Uh, complete uh, their full clinical development, but, but the, the capability exists. Um, it's just a matter of really transitioning it. Some of those can even be used for restoring movement in folks living with paralysis. And imagine being able to put you know, units in to different mm -hmm. targeted muscles, for restoring that movement. How, how is your work going on that? Uh, it's going well. And uh, the, the current participant has uh, really exceeded everyone's expectations. Does uh, everybody knows the story here, I guess? Uh, you don't have to tell. It's, I it's, think so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this group knows, yeah. You covered this. Yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty, I, and I yeah. met him. He's a fantastic young man. He is man. an incredible an amazing young man. Amazing young man. Yeah, and he's extremely dedicated, uh, comes in uh, and uh, just spends hours. We try to offer you know breaks. He never takes them. Uh, he has uh, every month made uh, another huge step forward, and uh, he's moving individual fingers now. It's just wow, unbelievable. That's fantastic. But he, uh, he really has, um, that's a great example of uh, not just viewing somebody as a patient, but as a partner as well. I mean, yes. I really think that that's, that's an individual who's helped, you know, push you guys even further. Oh, yeah. We always talked uh, about him as a member of the team. He really mm -hmm. was. I mean, it was um, unbelievable. He would ask uh, great questions, a uh, whole little story. Uh, you could see there was a couple monitors, the one he was supposed to always look at, and then uh, there was another one that had some of the code, the software. So he got to where he kept looking over at the software, and one day during a session, uh, he looked over and he said, you know, on line 51, I think you have an error. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Wow. He was right. <laughs> oh, man. No kidding. So he was definitely a part of the team. Well, so what's the vision then? What, what, let's just go down the line here. What are, what are we going to be? Are we going to be, um, do we see a future where most any disease or affliction can be uh, redressed by something that's implantable or some uh, change in the uh, electrical circuitry of our bodies? 
once we understand the mechanisms which diseases can actually be affected by neuromodulation, then those diseases I can imagine we in principle should be able to treat with a device that may not look like a brick that will be inserted through a large tube, but it actually will be potentially a fluid, but still act as a device. Uh, and that's within the realm of possibility. And then we will have sensors to go with it to run in a closed loop system. Uh, and in the case of the type of work that Chad is doing, I think they're getting very, very close to being very good at motor control. There's one simple little component that is missing, and that is something that Doug is working on in his pro program, which is sensory. Because those beautiful prosthetic arms, we, they can move the fingers, and Chad's patient uh, subjects and partner can move the fingers. The question is, can he or she feel? Right. And currently, no. So Does he get any feedback? He's, he's got a little bit, doesn't he, he or not? A, a tiny bit on the yeah. side, but he has commented on the fact yeah. that uh, huh. that he can't, he's thankful for the recovered you know, movement, but he can't feel the object, and it's kind of a, a strange uh, kind of situation. So do you have to you have to route something back to him? I guess. Yes. So uh, absolutely. Which and right, into just what he's much doing, like right? with prosthetics, but in this case, uh, we'll actually uh, pick up information about the touch, and then we'll actually reroute it and, and enter into the brain. We'll stimulate the sensory cortex right next door to the motor cortex, mm -hmm. and that will actually, after we try different patterns, we'll uh, restore that sense of touch. Mm -hmm. So Pit and then can yeah. I can I add one? Yeah, so of course. You, yeah. You, you were covered everything. Okay, so. One other thing that is extremely important is that we're taking what we've learned uh, in terms of decoding and deciphering brain activity, and we're now looking at uh, signals in the peripheral nervous system. And if you think about it, our bodies have millions of receptors that are picking up all sorts of uh, different pieces of information and, and monitoring bacteria entering the body and pathogens. Uh, and and what, if we could tap into that information and use the sensors that are already there and actually decode or decipher those signals and then predict uh, the, you know, something like cancer coming or progressing or coming back, uh, or uh, in diabetes, uh, glucose uh, levels, uh, or that you're at risk for becoming, let's say, diabetic, uh, type two or type one even. Um, you know, these are, uh, you know, the key to treating disease is of course, catching it early in most cases. Mm -hmm. And if you had real-time diagnostics like that, I think it would revolutionize uh, medicine. What's that Star Trek gadget? The holodeck? Is that what it's called? Is <laughs> the that, tricorder. Or, that's it. That's it. Is that? Is so that it's where like we're... the implantable tricorder. Yeah. And I just trademarked that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, is I, I mean, are we going to cure cancer with this? Is that what we're talking about here? Or? Maybe, maybe. And, and I think we may do simpler things first. And I think a really important thing as a doctor, dosing is always a problem. Both compliance, as you mentioned, but also getting the right dose in the right place at the right time. And I think uh, bioelectronic medicine has a problem, uh, promise with these closed loop devices to actually do that, create individualized medicine that, that bypasses this problem. So I think that would be a huge leap forward actually. Maybe not so science fiction-y as, as uh, some of the other stuff here, but, but with, the, uh, with, with the device that actually does something sim uh, close to that, that would really not be expensive. We would not have to worry about the cost. Being sick is super expensive right, for society right. and for, and side effects cost a huge chunk of, of the uh, uh, healthcare budget. So I think if we can do that, we, we're actually going to save a lot of money. Yeah, we don't have a system that really rewards preventative work though, do we? We've got to work on that. I think that's another issue entirely. But uh, So it, when you say dosing, what do you mean by dosing? Oh, you, I mean you, that you get the right dose of, uh, of, of a... So even simple... I mean, I'm, we're talking about electrical doses, is that well, what you mean, essentially? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, but yeah. we're talking about electrical doses, but for, for, for very well-known medicines like morphine, there's at least like a tenfold difference in, your, in everybody's sensitivity. So if we now can replace, uh, if we can replace drugs with, with electricity and monitor the response, then, then we can do completely amazing things from a doctor's perspective and from the patient's perspective compared yeah, well, to what, what we have available today. We haven't talked much about pain management, but I imagine there's tremendous possibilities there. I mean, certainly uh, as an alternative to uh, opiates, I mean, not even, not even close. Absolutely, and I think that's another very interesting and great aspect about this, that we can, instead of doing something exogenous and something we came up with that we think works, we, we instead can tap into the, the, the systems that are already in place 
and use uh, what's already there. And that, we hope, may circumvent a lot of the, the unwanted side effects. Because if we actually, like a pacemaker, as you mentioned, if we, if we, it just overcomes the neural transmission problem, really. <coughs> and uh, if we could do that with, with other, uh, other organs uh, than the heart, that would be absolutely fantastic, I think. And if, you, if you could, if you had the choice of an elective gadget to put in your body to make you better, faster, stronger, smarter, what would it be? You, go, go ahead first. <laughs> 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 I want a haptic feedback device. So, uh, so I, I think can... you've got two of them right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for virtual reality gaming, oh, like, imagine yeah, yeah, yeah. virtual reality being able to be immersed in a, wow, in, wow. A, in a virtual that would be environment, very cool. and it's more than just visual. You know, imagine that you yeah. touch objects and you feel them. You recognize their texture. You recognize wow. they're hard and soft. Um, That's pretty. I, I think cool. that would be. Um, Amazing. That we'd be in the matrix then for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, Peter, what would you I'd what'd rather, you, you know, I, I'm thinking long term here. I'd rather have something that monitors my physiology so I really know uh, inflammatory state and, and, and when I'm getting sick so I can do things about it. Yeah. Well, as my kids keep reminding me that I'm getting apparently old, <laughs> <laughs> I would think enhanced uh, memory. Yes. A device we could put uh, yeah. in the brain. Um, I would like a device that goes across the spinal cord when it's severed. That'd be a big one. Yeah. As for me, I, I would like to be able to click my teeth and do a Google search, you know, and just know what's going on so I'd be really smart all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all. I really appreciate it. I don't, I'm not sure we came close to what was published, but I hope you enjoyed it and uh, hope you had a good conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.